My name is Dr. Emmanuel Ngobo, and I will be your facilitator for today's session. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, truly warm welcome to everyone to our local government conversations, which is themed reshaping the local government landscape, the road ahead. We are trusting that it will bring further enlightenment to understanding of local government in South Africa, but furthermore contribute towards the positive change that we all want to see in our municipalities. Um, we value your participation um, uh, for, our, for you being here with us this morning, joining to listen to the presenters and uh, the panel discussions to take place. We also welcome the comments and questions, but please be aware that due to time, we can't attend to them all, but we will strive to do what we can, but limited to the time available to us. With that being said, let me just do a, a quick five minute intro into today's session. And then thereafter, I will be handing over to our first presenter for the sake of time. All right, um, the series itself is brought to you by Future Cities Africa, as well as the Municipal Edge. And as said, the theme of it is reshaping the local government landscape. And we are looking ahead in terms of the improvement that we want to see. Also, uh, the Chartered Institute of Government Finance Auditors and Risk Officers, as well as SALGA, that you all know, is also supporting this initiative. Um, last week, we looked at uh, the aspect of professionalization of our local government, whether do we have the adequate skills um, that is actually fit for purpose, as well as looking at the issues of leadership, uh, the political side of it, which was quite interesting of what was discussed last week. We do have the recordings for those who may, may not have joined us last week. We will be able to share those. And then this uh, morning, we are going to be looking at the origins of our local government, and obviously, yes, we appreciate what has been done, but importantly, where are we going um, in the future, which is the discussion that we'll be having. And then I've listed all the other uh, sessions that are to come in the next coming weeks. Um, we truly appreciate business engineering, a very innovative business that has uh, sponsored today's session. It truly, as you know, we do this at no cost to those who are attending, but we, we uh, are sharing the information, the expertise, and I know the time involved, but that is then obviously somebody has to somehow foot the bill for it. And we appreciate our partners for this particular session uh, being business engineering. As you can see on your screens, there's quite various uh, services that they offer uh, to municipalities, uh, but I wouldn't go into them. I'm trusting that um, Mr. Philip, when he comes in, you will share more about what they actually do as a business. Uh, our speakers for today and the panelists, uh, firstly, as indicated, Philip Brain from uh, Business Engineering. We have Dr. Boiwe Tsako, uh, an expert in local government. We also have the much known uh, Sitol Mbanga, the CEO of the South African Cities Network, and also a very passionate uh, individual, Dr. Lawson Naido, previously with uh, National Treasury. Now he is uh, with the Tuani University of Technology in the academic space. But I said, quite passionate about local government uh, issues, and especially within the subject of supply chain management. So we are looking forward to this session of today. So the actual uh, proceedings, we will look at the first uh, presentation uh, by uh, Mbanga, which will look at the origins of local government, the current landscape of where we are, and as said, uh, possibilities of where we are headed, especially for the cities as it comes from the perspective. And then we look at the practical perspective, uh, which uh, Mr. Philip, as well as his colleague, who will join as well at the later stage when we're doing the panel discussion, um, will touch on a few aspects, and then we'll have the views of our panel members, and then thereafter have some discussions in relation to what would have been presented. So with those words, once again, thank you so much. We hope that we will have a very impactful and uh, fruitful session, and you will be empowered with the thoughts that are to be shared this morning. So um, now I'm gonna be handing over uh, to uh, Mr. Sitole Mbanga to then come in and uh, do his presentation and thereafter go on further. Baba Mbanga, are you ready to go on your side? Uh, you can unmute, yes, the, that button that must be pressed. Oh. <laughs> 
There we go. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks. I apologize for that. Uh, Dr. Ngobo, I'm wondering, you do have my presentation, right, with you? Uh, yes, yes, I do have it, sir. Yes. Do you... I've oh, had yeah. to move because we have uh, lost electricity in my area. So if you don't mind, I wouldn't mind if you guys can be able to flight it. Thanks very much. I, 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 that's the presentation. I'm going to ask you to just navigate it for me. Colleagues, good morning. Um, I hope the noise outside is not going to be disturbing you at all. It's, it's, uh, it's actually relaxing, uh, Mr. Mabanga. So no worries. We, it's so <laughs> relaxing to hear the bats chipping at the back. So all is good, sir. Yeah, I, and, and I suspect those are the, 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 the unintended consequences of load shedding, you know, that I've had to quickly try to move to another place. Uh, and I, here I am in a very tranquil uh, area. And, and thanks very much to yourself and um, good morning to uh, all the panelists uh, uh, that are here for today's seminar. And of course, I mean, good morning to everybody that is in attendance. It's a very... Um, interesting uh, topic uh, right around the issues of local government. In the last two weeks, for instance, uh, if not three, we have been participating in, in, in conferences, regional or provincial conferences of the South African Local Government Association, um, which is um, uh, uh, preparing for its national conference that will be held in Cape Town in, in, in a fortnight from now. And what is, what is interesting in it is, is the extent to which, in my opinion anyway, there is an understanding of the background of local government. So this is a very uh, relevant uh, topic. I wish that um, in Salga as well, colleagues will find the opportunity to orientate there, there will be plus minus um, at least 70% of councillors that are new in the local government field that are coming to govern in an environment that is extremely volatile at this point in time. Um, it's, 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 I think we, 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 we must ready ourselves for a lot of instability in the next five years. Anyway, that being said, if you go to my next slide, I, I think uh, I think we can talk about local government um, as far back as we possibly can. But I think for me, I've chosen to start in the early 80s. Um, and, and that is because um, in, in the 80s, I think colleagues will remember, this was the time when um, there was a lot of political activity that was taking place. Um, there was a lot of yearning for change. There were many organizations that were being established to try to fight against the, 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 the apartheid system of governance that was um, in place at that point in time. And I think notably, the um, uh, United Democratic Front was the one umbrella organization of civic organizations um, uh, uh, that, that were involved uh, on issues and matters of governance at that point in time. On the one hand, you had black local authorities, right? So, 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 so in a way, local government was racially divided. It, it had nothing to do, well, not to say it had nothing to do will be extremist, but on the main, the imperative was to divide it along racial lines. So you had black local authorities, right? Um, whose task on the main uh, was very minimalistic from a governance point of view. It was more about uh, rubbish collection. Um, not that it's not a, it's not an important thing. It's an important thing, but I think governance is more than just the collection uh, of of rubbish. It is more. I think as we have defined it in it, as this particular generation, it is more about the delivery of services. But at that stage, I mean, the black local authorities on the main they were very minimalistic in their. Um, in their, in their, in, in their uh, work. And predominantly, the black local authorities were in townships and in rural areas, the Bantustan, the TVBC states, um, uh, Transkai, Vendaba, Potatswana, and, and the likes. And then you then had a second uh, a, a formation within the sphere of local government or within the fraternity of local government, which were like uh, uh, local authorities that were um, aimed on, on the main at, 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 at service provisioning for areas that were regarded as white areas. So they will be called the white local authorities. 
um, that had adequate powers, they had adequate functions, they were able to do, they, in, in fact, on the whole, they didn't have to worry much about fiscus because they were quite heavily subsidized or cross subsidized from other um, uh, uh, parts of the, of, of, the, of the system. And the third one was uh, the advisory committees that were established for, um, for, for the Indian or the so-called uh, colored and Indian communities. And, 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 and thus basically bearing fruit um, uh, to the point that I made earlier that in the 80s, predominantly, if you thought about local government, you had to think about it from a racial perspective rather than from a services provisioning point of view or from a governance uh, point of view. What was interesting, though, was that immediately after the formation of the UDF, and, and by the way, the UDF um, itself had been a formation that was made up of a lot of, as I indicated, a plethora of, of, um, of, of civil, so, civic society organizations. Government at that stage institutionalized what was called the Regional Services Council, which was a very um, uh, important um, uh, aspect of, of, of the governance. And, and, and this was in lieu or in part as a, in response to the wave of protests that was being experienced at the time. There was lots of protests around basic services, water, um, uh, uh, cleaning up, but also the tax that was imposed on those communities forced the government to start to, to look at or to think about a system or a structure, to say the least, that will be utilized for the provisioning of, 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 of services. And, and I think it's an important thing to, 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 it's an important point to make around how some of the lessons or of the experiences that came out of that apartheid system actually found their way into, I mean, the, 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 the issues around the, 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 the regional um, uh, uh, services councils, councils which had levies. I mean, you find them in the system as we have it now. I mean, the district model that you have today in part came as a result of the lessons that were learned on how effective they were. In fact, they were quite effective, I must say, the regional services uh, councils, save the fact that they were around uh, 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 racial lines. And I think what made the, the RSCs quite effective was that they had focus. They focused on what was called the engineering services of, 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 uh, of, um, of what the function of the municipalities were. And it is a very important uh, issue to, to make. And, and into, the, into the, uh, the 2000s, I mean, those, of, those lessons had been um, uh, uh, learned, and I think it's a very important um, uh, 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 issue. One thing, if you look at the slide at the very, at the very bottom, I and mean, there's a box there, it talks about the fact that the civic movement, I mean, were quite instrumental and the quite powerful um, uh, structures that drove and influenced what happened in the, in, in, in the, in, in the 80s uh, type of, of, um, of, of a period. The one thing that I must say, which is what you see on the second slide, is the issue of, of revenue, which is a very relevant thing. Today, in local government, you'll hear practitioners in local government protesting about how inadequately local government is funded. Give or take, since democracy, local government has been funded by no more than 9% of the national fiscus. And when I say that, I'm excluding um, uh, 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 the grants that get to be uh, apportioned to local government. I'm talking about the actual loc uh, allocation from the national fiscal. It has never been. Uh, it is not. It has never been more than nine percent. Right now, that 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 should tell you something about how some of the failures that you see today in local government can be attributed to the fact that uh, there is um, there's inadequate. Um, funding of local government. And I'm saying this because in the 90s, I remember there was a slogan, which was called One City, One Tech Space. And, 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 and that slogan was, was basically a clarion call to government that even the poorest people that are part and parcel of, uh, of society in those local governments, they contribute in one way or the other to the revenue 
of the municipalities. So the point was, how do you ensure that there is equitability, right? So the one, one city, one tax bill, it was about the fact that everybody contributes in one way or the other, right? Today, we have a very progressive tax uh, system that, 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 that forces everybody. I mean, even, even unemployed people do pay tax. I mean, the value added tax, for instance, right, is in part a contribution to the revenue of the, of, of the country and therefore by extension to the revenue of, of, the, of, of, the, um, of the municipalities. And I think as we know, Post um, uh, uh, the, 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 the 1980s into the 1990s, when um, negotiations started, then there were negotiations, the local government negotiations forum. So whilst, whilst the Cordesa negotiations started, there were uh, small uh, platforms that were created, right? To, 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 to have it, to look at how negotiations in the local government space will take place. They were very much sector-based, right? There will be negotiations around water issues. There will be negotiations around electricity. There will be negotiations around transport um, uh, issues. And those forums ultimately led to the establishment um, of the white paper on local government, which was the blueprint document that was utilized um, in order for us to, to get to a point where we could um, uh, 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 get to the type of system um, uh, that, that, that we have. If you go to, the, to your next slide, for instance, you'll start to see that um, it, the, the next slide, thanks very much. We, we, I make reference to the white paper in, in 1998. I was fortunate enough to have been part and parcel um, of those um, negotiations on the sidelines, by the way, right? As a part and parcel of the secretariat, taking notes for this and that person and ensuring that there's a cobbling of those particular notes. So it was a very exciting time, I must say, you know, because here yeah, we were as a nation and as society having the opportunity to craft a vision of what local government would do. And I think the most important thing for, for me that would come out of those negotiations was a new role definition for local government, right? To say that local government is not just, as I indicated, it's not just about the collection of, 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 um, of, of rubbish. That local government was to play a very central role um, in the governance, in changing society, moving society from an otherwise divided, racially divided society in, into the establishment of a non-racial society. So, so, so there you go. So sometimes when we, when we speak about local government, we tend to be very minimalist in how we understand the role of local government. And of course, yes, it's about basic services, right? But over and above that, it's about driving the economy as well, which is something that in the previous iteration of the role of local government, it was not there. So the white paper was quite instrumental. And once the white paper had been agreed upon and was utilized as a framework for those negotiations and, and, and formally established after the first democratic local government elections in the year 2000, then you had the formal uh, assimilation of um, your structures, your systems. In fact, it started immediately with the demarcation bill, if you remember, right? Where I think um, Mike Sutcliffe, um, Dr. Mike Sutcliffe at that, at that point in time was the chairperson of the demarcation board where um, uh, uh, the, the demarcation municipalities, I think we used to have plus minus 2000 municipalities, plus minus, right? Plus in fact, not minus. And, and those municipalities had to be rationalized, right? To a point where today we find ourselves with anything between 250 and 270. And I'm saying anything between 250 and 270 in municipalities because I'm also accommodating for, um, uh, for, for, for the changes that have taken place since the year 2000, where there have been more metropoli uh, metropolitan municipalities, i.e. Um, uh, Mangawung or what used to be called um, Bloemfontein is one such particular example. Buffalo City is one such example. So post the, the white paper on local government, particularly the point where we have had the first democratic elections, the one thing that happened was then a plethora of legislation, policy and legislation that was intended to support 
uh, the establishment of the of the of the local uh, government uh, phase. I must just indicate that there were phases that led to 2000. Um, there was a, a the, 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 the interim phase, and then there was the pre there was the pre interim phase, and then there was the interim phase. Remember, um, after once the national negotiations in Cordesa had taken place, the one thing that um, uh, that then uh, happened was the local government negotiations, as I indicated, that were. Um, um, that were um, uh, uh, a follow up uh, following the, the, the adoption of the constitution in the year 2006. If you skip the slide, I mean, I'm not going to speak into, into, into a lot of detail into this, but I think this, this slide is very important to the extent that if you were to speak of it, you could speak for almost a day, right? Um, so in 2000, local governments, democratic local governments have been established right there is the mig that gets to be established which is a grant um, that is intended to support local governments in delivering their grants there is a project project consolidate if you recall right so <laughs> one of the things about local government is that oh over the period, there have been so many initiatives aimed at supporting local government. And the very first one uh, was Project Consolidate. So today we speak about the DDM. Um, we spoke about um, uh, uh, um, uh, the back to basics. I mean, there's just been so many uh, initiatives that have been driven towards local government aimed at ensuring that local government does become or does uh, 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 is able to to fulfill its role and yet we still find ourselves in a situation where um it, it is still we cannot with confidence say why is local government uh, not as functional as, as 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 we as we would have wanted it to be. I personally blame it on the system. I don't think the problems of local government are uh, of local governments making a law. I think there's something fundamentally wrong with the entire system of governance um, that we need to, 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 to interrogate. Most recently, I, 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 I can say between the year 2016 and now, the one thing I think that has led to, 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 that has added to the failures of local government's ability to deliver has been the fact that I think political parties um, have been fighting amongst themselves. I think political parties that have been in government, those that have been in government have been focused on how do we stay in the office and those that are outside of office have been focusing on how do we get those that are in office out of office. So it has been a political fight and a total defocus from the imperative of service delivery, of driving the, the economy, of ensuring that uh, th there are jobs. And then you then add to all of that what, what I call um, uh, the, the, the three epochs of um, uh, uh, instable uh, uh, governance or the environment in which local governments, and, and you can trace this as far back as 2008. In 2008, one of the things that happened globally was the global economic meltdown. And I think we all saw it. That had a devastating impact on South African um, go local government, but also in globally, you know, it was not just South Africa because uh, 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 the, the, the financial meltdown also meant that the municipalities themselves were going to be impacted upon. And then the next uh, epoch was uh, the climate change. You know, suddenly um, the rate at which the impact of climate change was taking place had a quick impact on municipalities, extreme drought in, in certain instances, vis-a-vis -vis extreme floods in other instances. The energy uh, issues, and I'm not talking just about electricity, just energy. Remember that in part, local government's um, a, a, a lifeline is dependent on its ability to raise is resources, uh, financial resources, and those uh, financial resources, um, for that to happen, it depends on organizations or institutions such as ESCOM. And at some point, I think we all know that um, ESCOM was just a, had just become unreliable uh, uh, from a point of view of being able to provide el electricity so that municipalities can then be able to reticulate and put that on their books as uh, in such a manner that they become sustainable um, organizations. And, and so there's all those kinds of things. And then the third one 
is the one that we have just gone through now, which I think we're still going through, which is the health emergency. Um, the, the, the health emergency of, um, um, of, of COVID-19. I, I, we did a very quick um, assessment um, during COVID, um, working in conjunction with National Treasury, Salga, and, and the chief financial officers from the various municipalities, particularly the metros. And the one thing that came out was that those municipalities that are heavily dependent on the national fiscals did not feel the impact of COVID. Right from a financial sustainable organizational sustainability point of view, those that are uh, generating their self their own revenue, such as municipalities, really felt. I mean, they lost no less than thirty to forty percent of their revenue as a result of the fact that there was an economic uh, uh, a slowdown. Last slide, thanks very much, um, Dr. Nobo. Is where are we now? Now we are. Um, in, in an era where we are espousing um, the, 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 the integrated urban development uh, framework, which I think is a very um, important uh, 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 um, piece um, of policy and, um, and uh, th that, that was adopted by South Africa in, in the um, around 20, 2015, adopted by cabinet. But unfortunately, we have not been able to, 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 to implement that effectively. And what does it say? I mean, it talks about the, the need for us to start crafting our municipalities um, uh, 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 institutional path towards creating livable, safe, um, resource efficient, economically inclusive type of cities. And it identifies four strategic goals, the goal of inclusion, the goal of spatial integration, because that is one of the, 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 the Achilles heel of, of local government and the issues of governance. And the, uh, I think the fourth one is inclusive um, uh, uh, growth. And it articulates very clearly um, about nine levers uh, against which if you evaluate the efficacy of a municipality, you will need to, uh, to, uh, uh, to go through. And I think that's where we are at this point in time as a country. Whether or not we are going to be able to achieve this, I think is a subject of discussion for, an, for another time. But there we are. Very shortly, uh, very short about the, the background and the history of local government. But I think, as if, as you can see, among those slides are themselves a framework of a lot of flesh that can be thrown into where it is that we come from. Thanks very much uh, for the invitation. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, very informative. And I didn't mention this at the beginning. We actually want to further do literature, literature reviews on this information that you're receiving here. They try to put the academias with us because all of this information we are hoping is going to be so useful as we craft our way forward you know, in local government. As you said, there's been so much of initiatives done over the years, you know, and, and, and we ask ourselves, why are we where we are with all that has been done, you know, and where are we heading in future? So we are hoping now as we get into this collaborative mode, everyone working together and then involving as much as possible the academias as well. You know? Yes, I, I do love them. Uh, I myself work with them so closely, but there's also the issue of you know, theorizing too much at times, but we want to bring in the practical side and then merge it with this theory that we so need that can definitely take us you know, uh, forward. So thank you so much for, for those uh, thoughts that you've shared and critique the experience as well. I wasn't aware that you come from the the school of the white paper back in the days. It shows oh, yes. by the way. I was young. I was very young, but it was an interesting <laughs> time. <laughs> but thanks very much. Yeah. Oh, great stuff. Great stuff. So let me now bring in um, Mr. Philip to come in as well to share the practical side of it as well. And then we will take it from there. Uh, Cornell has also joined us. If ever he also wants to come in, feel free, Cornell, because you are part of this. If not, you will then come through during the panel discussion. Over to you, Mr. Philip. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Novo, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's, a, it's a privilege and honor for us to participate in, uh, in the discussion this morning. Extremely informative. Um, I, indeed, was also very young when um, I started with the uh, local government experience. I had a lot of hair and, uh, and a, lot less, uh, a lot less wrinkles. So uh, the company's business engineering, and we a consultancy that have been focusing in local government since the early 2000s, 2002. Um, we started off with many customers. There were, I think, 900 or 850 municipalities when we started. 
and um, we're in a diminishing economy. I mean, I think we've got 235 left. Um, just to give you some idea, this is really where we work uh, on a national basis at, uh, at most local and uh, district municipalities, um, at least representation in any one of the provinces. Um, if we just quickly go through our agenda, um, I'm just going to touch on the legislative drivers and give you some background as to where we come from. I'm going to just focus on our approach, uh, what we've been doing for the last 15, 20 years, um, our achievements, um, what we've achieved, and then some of the platform and functionality um, uh, that we've created on a, on a national basis. Um, if we just look at le legislative frameworks within government and local government very specifically, there are a number of, of, of supportive um, um, legislati legislation that we have to conform to. Um, from the DORA Act, the Spluma Act, the Constitution um, being the, the overarching um, uh, directive, um, Electronic Communication Act, especially in the age that we are living. So whatever we've been doing um, or what we are doing really focuses on ensuring that we comply with the legislative frameworks. The, this list is, might not be an exhaustive list, but this is really the core as we as we see it. Now, I'm just quickly going to show you, it's a few slides, I don't have really have time to go through this, but just look at the support for the powers and functions. Now, start off with finance, uh, community services, um, all the aspects that uh, are being addressed uh, in those areas, planning, uh, technical services, the environmental health environment, which is uh, practically split between district municipalities and local municipalities. And then when we deal with a metro, um, all those functions are, are in, in, in one central place, um, which brings with it its own challenges in deployment. Um, human resources, uh, with the advent of the new, new act, the new legislative framework that's about to, to uh, um, be implemented on a national basis, uh, we see a lot of activity there. Corporate services, property management, then records, decision management, the legal framework, primarily dealing with contract management and a few other things as well. Now, if we just look at our approach, um, what we've seen in the last few years is a, is a significant drive from, from central government with regards to standardization. Um, we in local government have had the advent of the MFMA um, in 2007, 2008, um, which brought a whole new way of um, procurement uh, to, to us as organizations. We've just recently come through um, the implementation of a standard chart of accounts, the the um, much spoken about MSCOA processes. Now, standardization is critical. It's very, very important um, to support the business processes um, of, of local government. Through the support of the business processes, in, interoperability between this ballot or various systems also forms, forms a critical part. Now, if we just look at standardization, um, for us, standardization primarily deals with the the standardization of the stakeholder interface so that consumers, local, provincial, national government all have a single view. It mustn't be too disparate. It must present the information um, in a predictable manner, um, accurately when and, and, and how and when it's, uh, it's required. If we just look at the issues with regards to standardization of data, um, the advent of the central supply database really brought significant changes, but it forced us to standardize the way in which we interact um, across uh, spectrums. The MSCOA deployment, the strings that have been submitted to National Treasury um, automatically out of systems, out of financial systems, to provide us with a clear view of um, the financial state of municipalities on a national basis. Now, the data sharing, again, formal, um, uh, processes includes the whole supplier management processes, the MSCOA strings, etc. And then if we look at the informal aspects, not informal, meaning that they are not as important as formal processes, they're critical, but looking at spatial data, um, creating standardized catalogs for goods and services so that we know that a pencil that we buy in, in Polokwane is going to cost the same as a pencil that we buy in, in, in Springbok. So those are very critical aspects that we've seen um, through the introduction of data sharing in both the formal and the informal um, areas. 
Now, this slide doesn't really speak to the business processes of metro municipalities or our mega cities, um, but it deals with all the aspects involved. Um, if we just look at stakeholder uh, interaction with municipalities, there are many things that we do on a daily basis. Um, it is not only about water and lights. We have land use applications that needs to be addressed, building plan applications. There is a big drive nationally um, in a uh, for the reduction of red tape um, in local government, government in general, and um, the issuing of business licenses, um, hosting of events. Um, those things we see as being as being critical and need to be focused on and create conduits so that these applications can be approved um, quickly, efficiently, timelessly. Um, some areas in local government, you know, it, it is okay for us to do or take seven or eight days for something to happen because that's what the legislative framework says. In fact, we can do it immediately. And that's really what we're driving at is if we can do something now, let's create the environment so we can do it now. Now, all those business processes are generally self-explanatory, something that we've seen um, especially after COVID is the payment arrangements and, um, and then unemployment and a drive by local government to create um, online uh, platforms where people can actually apply for a job and um, be employed by the local municipality in the local area. Right. So what we've achieved so far is that we've managed to establish an architectural platform, which I'll go through in a bit more detail now. We've established an intermunicipal technology platform um, that facilitates communication across all spheres of government. And I'll give you some detail on that. Um, we've established a bi-directional communication platform really to ensure that we can move large documents around. Um, you can't email a building plan application or a um, application for development. Uh, you can use Dropbox or you can use um, uh, OneDrive. But what we've done is we've created technology that allows um, developers to submit building plans um, to municipalities um, from anywhere in the world. Um, we've established integration to the various MSCO compliant ERP systems. So wherever there is a financial implication or financial transaction, we need to issue a receipt that that's done um, automatically without you having to go to another office or another port of call, um, for instance, to get a receipt and to just drive two blocks further to show the receipt that you've actually paid for the use of the community hall. So we've got online services for for a, a great deal of these um, these aspects. Uh, critical and core is for each of the institutions participating in any of these initiatives to maintain their own proper records management system. Now, this is not only important from a uh, audit perspective, but it also is important from um, just a normal corporate corporate governance uh, environment. Now, I'd like to go through a few slides that just deals with our proof of concept. So basically what you're seeing here is both external and, and municipal um, stakeholders accessing a system through what we call a portal, right? Now, basically what this deals with is that we've got the municipal entities, the district municipalities and the local municipalities connected. Now, I'll give you an example, a few examples now. The significance is that a person, a stakeholder can access this wealth of information either by a cell phone or tablet, or desktop, and also information are being received um, that uh, initiates certain business processes through IoT devices. So if the air quality in a specific area um, is problematic, that then triggers an alarm that is automatically addressed, and then we take the corrective action uh, to that regard. Now, if I can just quickly explain to you basically what we've done here. Um, so really looking at the intermunicipal communications. Now, I've got a few examples, land use applications, way leave applications, customer service requests, event management, building control, business licenses, etc., etc. Right. So what we say is that or what we do is that we initiate the transaction from outside of the of the organization, um, call it the public cloud or the internet for want of a better word. This can happen from your cell phone um, or any other of the other platforms that, that I've explained. Now, through the internet, that application is then presented to the local municipality. Now, you'll see the workflows numbered, one through uh, 
13, I think, if I just see, yeah, 1, two, one through 12, right? So it starts, just to show, it starts off at a specific area, it then gets to the local municipality, and this might be a building plan application where um, a shopping center is going to be erected in uh, MLSN, right? So um, in order for this building plan to be approved by the local municipality, it needs input from disaster management and health that is seated at the district municipality. So once the application is completed at the local level, it's handed electronically to the district function. They then go through the process of saying, yes, we approve or no, there's not enough fire hydrants, move the stairs, um, install uh, different escape routes, etc. It's then updated, completed at the district level. It then goes back to the local municipality or the local level uh, for a, 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 could be for just a rubber stamp. Ultimately, communication then goes back to the member of the public or the person that initiated the the, um, the request. Now, a, a very good example that I like using with regards to um, what I'm showing you here is that uh, the BMW uh, motor company uh, from Stuttgart in Germany launched an application to film a ad for the new GS motorcycle in Mossel Bay. And that entire application was handled electronically. No one came to South Africa. No one went from South Africa to Germany. It was approved. It was done and the first very first interaction that the municipality had with the entity was when they arrived with their big trucks to to host the event now we've got many examples like that and it really excites us to be able to add value um, and to increase the quality of life of the people in our in our communities oh this is very busy but this is really what i've just been explaining to you so what we have at the moment running and operational in the western cape and this could be any province um and we're really looking for traction uh, for this uh, on a national basis and we have been in discussions with with various other provincial structures but really what we've done is we've created this environment so that everything and everybody can speak with each other now all these systems at these various municipalities are disparate doesn't mean that everybody is using a similar um, financial application or a similar um, GIS application. These are all disparate applications and all of these applications speak together in the interoperability framework that we've been able to establish, allowing this communication to happen, allowing a person in Thrindal at the Matsukama municipality to interact with the district municipality in Muriesburg. Um, similar to the central Karoo, we have great distances um, the Cape Winelands, very similar. Garden Route, you have a uh, great population of people, close quarters, but very diverse, diverse services. So this is just an example of what we've achieved and what we have done, explaining most of what we what we've been on about in the in the presentation in the earlier slides. Now, if we just look at the statistical overviews, the data here is a bit low, but it comes from COVID sort of mid 2020 to 2021, um, but just gives you an idea of what's happening. Air quality applications, building applications, building plan applications. Um, now, building plan application approval is significant for the revenue streams of any local municipality. Because as soon as we can get the building plan approved, we can have the dwelling erected and we can start building for services. Now, that's the one aspect. The other aspect that also falls into the building plan environment is the minor building works. Now that's where a person on the back of a cigarette box will draw a line and say, I want to, I want to build this wall. Now, technically, um, it has to go through an entire approval process. The implement, the, the measures that we've implemented is that that informal building work can be approved immediately. As soon as it's, as, as it's lodged with the municipality, an official will look at the diagram it conforms to everything that needs to be conformed and it can approve. So we're really trying to cut down on the overall um, uh, interaction or service delivery uh, uh, framework within, within the municipalities. Um, it also speaks to the national indicators. So um, we're very, very excited about, uh, about that. Land use applications is another very important aspect that we're seeing, uh, getting a lot of traction um, and rezonings, etc. Um, are as important as the approval 
of a building claim. Not that any of the others uh, are not uh, important, but this is just uh, an overview. So what we've done is we've, I'm just going to give you a few slides. I'm nearly done. It really deals with consumer services and business services. So when we deal with the consumer and the services that we provide to the consumer, um, so the aspects that we feel important is account information, service request information, the ability to complain in a structured manner and be heard with the structured feedback, payment arrangements, rebate applications, and, and as I said earlier, a recruitment is really becoming a key driver in the consumer services space. Again, this is not an exhaustive list. It's just an example of, of what, we, what we've been working on in the last few years. With regards to business services, event permit applications, the issuing of business licenses, especially informal business licenses, um, is very important. Um, and then, uh, again, uh, the much spoken about uh, building plan applications. On the business licenses, I would just like to mention something. It's important that we understand the importance of issuing a business license to an informal trader in, a, in, a, in an acceptable manner, in a quick, easy, cost-effective manner. Because if he wants to sell um, uh, fed cook in front of the, the, the pharmacy on Saturday morning, he needs to be able to do that. The municipality will charge him his 25 rand. He will do that. But today, it's, most municipalities, it's, it's a discouraging effort. Um, it's just too much of an effort. So we have a lot of informal, illegal informal trading. And we have instances where your Metro Police and the Traffic Department closes down small little guys just because they didn't have the ability or didn't understand how to in, in, engage. Um, so that's a key aspect for us in, in, in business services. Uh, the capital projects, wayleave applications, especially where we have cell phone and not necessarily cell phone, but data fiber cables going down, um, the management of the entire process, and then a uh, land use applications. I would like to thank you so much for your much appreciated time. And uh, Dr. Noble, thank you, sir. No, thank you as well, uh, Mr. Philip. I, li I like the fact that, you know, we're, we're quite practical. It's more of a case study based, um, as we were saying earlier. It's good to blend in the theory and uh, practice because we can theorize as much as we can and all of these legislation in local government, but how to actually apply them. And this is exactly what you, you, you have touched on. And, you know, it, it, importantly as well, you know, the need to learn from one another. You know, the reality is, you know, Western Cape municipalities are doing, you know, quite better than others. Um, I don't try to get into any politics and anything, just, you know, the fact of the matter. And we hope that we can also take the learnings, you know, from those who are doing well, and then um, the other municipalities can also learn, you know, from them. So thank you so much for sharing uh, those insights. Um, Mr. Cornell, I'm not sure if you want to add in a few um, thoughts into this, or perhaps we can leave it to the panel discussion. Mr. Cornell, two minutes of your time, yes or no, then we can proceed. Thanks, Doctor. Um, yeah, what, what Philip has said, and, and just a comment, and, um, uh, what Mr. Mbanga said earlier, um, I think we've met somewhere because I was also part of that time. And very interesting. Um, and, and to add on what Philip has said is, uh, and maybe that's a topic uh, for that we can discuss, is how COVID has changed the, the way we are doing things. You know, um, uh, from a practical side, again, we were able to have a municipality that wasn't prepared uh, for COVID. I'm talking about infrastructure, laptops, they still had desktops, and you know, with, with the lockdown, we were able to run that municipality for them, uh, myself and, and one of my consultants, for a number of months, only uh, needing them to come and do payments, you know, obviously those critical transactions. But the municipality was running, the whole system was running, um, those who wanted to submit building plans in that day, in that time were able to do that um and yeah and and from from what we i think what we can learn from from the data that we are collecting in this and we haven't done that um is is to look at at migration um that is happening now you know you you spoke about western cape municipalities my um my data that I've analysis, uh, analyzed and, and um, that I'm following uh, closely is those patterns. And I think that is something that is a risk for, for our northern uh, metros. 
you know, um, just thinking about um, getting from the, start preparing them in terms of policies, because what happens if all these offices are, are devaluing because of, of they are not needed anymore, because people are working from home, that infrastructure comes in. And, um, I, I, and I've got personal experience because I'm also uh, actually busy constructing a house in the Western Cape, you know, um, and that municipality there is already prepared for working from home. The policies are in place. But, but the, the other effect is, is what is that affecting, um, you know, up north, what's going to happen here with, re with the revenue base? What are we doing here? And uh, Philip, maybe we can, at the later stage, just from, from what we get from land use and, and the building plans, uh, uh, those kind of things see, um, and our portal, because if you're registered on the portal, we can, you, and multiple municipalities, we can see where your properties are, and we can check your activity, um, get some, some uh, data, you know, for, for analysis and see what, what that patterns are causing and maybe in future it's going to impact on, on let me call them the northern uh, cities, you know, north meaning north of the Western Cape then, um, and, and maybe KZN as well, which is, which is uh, highly uh, populated by Gauteng people, you know, there's a migration every Easter weekend to, to, to those areas but it seems that more people are staying there and only coming home for Easter weekend back to Gauteng. That's the kind of patterns that we see, what we are seeing. But yes, I will, I would uh, comment later on, but just on adding on what Philip has said. And I think um, what Philip hasn't said, and he's maybe a little bit modest, um, with, with all the migrating municipalities, we were able to achieve the, the highest number of clean audits per service provider, if you look at that context, you know. Um, and we pride ourselves, but it is stuff that works. And it's not only the, it's in the Western Cape, it's also northern, uh, of the northern municipalities, you know. And I think um, what, what, is, what is done or what is shown is those things all uh, contribute to, to achieving that, because that is not the easy feat uh, to do. Uh, and to maintain as well, but I'll, but I'll um, give some more comments later on, if uh, if it's needed. Thank you. Uh, Dr. No, thank you, thank you, Mr. Cornell. Uh, definitely, you, you you must make mention of the successes. You know, there's so much of failures that that surrounds us. So thank you so much for that. Uh, we truly appreciate as well the, the extra comments that you have made mention after Philip. So at this time, I just want to bring in uh, Mr. And Banga, once again, in terms of this, there are some questions that have been posed as um, Dr. Voyewe released herself, because I'll bring her in shortly thereafter. I can just go firstly, um, navigate my way here. I just want to first bring in the comment that was made mention uh, earlier. Let me just go back here. I'm trying to work with uh, various screens. There's a comment I'm looking for. Oh, there we go. Um, this was from Daphne Ili. Thank you so much, Mr. Mbanga, for this informative presentation. I am particularly excited by the presentation because it provided me with a much needed revision for me subsequent to leaving local government that I'd worked for 11 years. Now I've been to return after completing my uh, studies, energy studies, as mentioned. So it looks like you have been an inspiration, uh, sir. And there are other comments as well that are there. And it's uh, kind of like a question. As I said, we will see how we attend to those. Uh, but also, if I can just go to the questions, I noted at the beginning, um, if maybe Mr. Mbanga, you can look at those just two first questions. Firstly, by uh, Zonani, Zonyane, uh, based on the funding model for mun of municipalities that you have made mention, uh, what needs to be done to ensure that the funding model talks to the current realities? In your view, I know that this is quite a matter that National Treasury and SALGA have been quite debating for quite a, some time, but perhaps if you can share some of your views around the funding model of municipalities. And then secondly, a question by uh, Terence Arensa. Thank you so much, Terence. I can see you've been quite active participating, sharing some comments in regards uh, to this. What is the panel's opinion on reducing the current government structure 
from a three tier structure to a two tier structure. Um, basically, we can look at this from a city's perspective. Um, uh, Mr. Mbanga, let me just hand over to you just to touch on these two aspects. I can also see Dr. Lassen will also share some of the thoughts as he's typing and answer that. Thank you so much. Over to you, Mr. Mbanga. Okay. Um, no, thanks very much. Um, so let me start with the with the first one uh, because I think there's a particular logic. The the question from from Teres about the the two spheres or the three spheres as we have them now. Look, the truth of the matter is that when the ANC went into negotiations during Codessa, it never had um, in mind that there was going to be three spheres of government, right? And I'm saying the ANC because it was the biggest um, uh, force in the negotiations. I think uh, let, let's, let's be frank and agree that at that stage, the National Party, which was in government, was very weak, right? As a, as a negotiating partner to, uh, to the progressive forces at that point in time. So you had um, a, a strong, um, uh, a, a democratic movement or or, or 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 a congress movement that was driving these negotiations having had the time and the luxury to think about what south africa should look like when they were in exile so it was always national and local but then during the negotiations themselves one of the things that happened is that there were quite a number of people that were being killed in kwazulu natal on the East Rand and anywhere else. And I think you will recall that one of the things that was that the, the, the IFP in particular was driving for a federal state. And in the, in, in the face of the many people that were dying, the compromise was, okay, there's a demand for um, a federal state, which will include one of the, of the tiers, which was provincial government and that was created. So it seems to me that the creation of the province was an afterthought. It was a reaction to something. There wasn't a lot of time invested in saying, what will the province do? And as a result of that, there were a lot of functions, powers and functions that were usurped from what would have been ideally local government functions and given to the sphere of government called the province at that point in time, right? And, now, I don't know whether we've got the political gut as a country to rethink that model. Um, and I'm, I'm saying this as per the question that was asked by Terence, I think, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think this requires not just political organization. It requires political organization, civil society, business to rethink the model. I think it will be dangerous to leave it to uh, political po to political parties only. Right. So, so that will be a very dangerous thing to do. So that's number one. But I think we need an all of society approach to how do we reimagine the state? Because I think there have been inherent failures as a consequence of the afterthought of putting in a provincial sphere of government. <clears throat> and I'm not saying provinces do not have a role, but I think municipalities have much of a role to play compared to provinces. After all, they are closest to the people, at least theoretically, which then goes to the second question around the funding model. I think if you were to tweak the current architecture of the state, right? You then will automatically be in a position to rethink the funding model because the funding model is consequent to the fact that you have forced a third sphere, right? Which is the provincial sphere onto a system that originally had national and local. And so naturally you then had to allow for a situation where this, the provincial sphere has to have a source of funding Unfortunately, what we did not do as a negotiating country at that stage was to then say, how are provinces going to generate their own revenue? Because they are not at the moment. Provinces are dependent on the national fiscus. And unfortunately, they do not generate or they don't contribute much compared to local government. Local government actually is the biggest generator of income for the national fiscus, full stop. And, and so it is on those bases that the golden goose that's laying the, 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 the egg has to be fed in one way or the other. 9% on its own is not, is not sustainable for local government. Thanks. Oh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, you've made so much of sense. And as we can see from the comment as well, there's much more coming out. You look to be inspiring a lot of us in this instance. And Mrs. Onyani hasn't indicated yesterday, 
He's also an expert in financial management. He has worked in Western Cape, has worked uh, for the treasury of the Gauteng as well. So, uh, you know, I think you've answered him adequately and appropriately, especially backed up by all that you understand of local government. And Mr. Mbanga, thank you, sir, for that. So at this time, I just want to uh, bring in for two minutes, won't be too long. There's a poll that we want to bring up on the screen. If you can just participate by clicking on the option that you want uh, us to look at, uh, if you can just pull that up quickly. Uh, do you think we have adequate legislative imperatives, the acts, the regulations to ensure accountability in our local government? Um, if you can just click um, on the one that you feel is appropriate for you, that you think is best. If we do have, there is quite a few. Um, Philip did make mention of some of the legislations that we have in local government. Uh, Mr. Mbanga as well touched on them. Uh, so, but we think they're actually uh, adequate within our local government uh, so that we can hold those who are there in power, hold administration to account and be responsible for what they undertake. So it looks like as we look at this, yes, 43 to some extent is 38. And there are some who say no. So if you say no, it, I will take that you want more uh, legislation uh, to come through local government. Well, that's what you feel. And then now I think we can just end the poll um, as we move on forward. Yeah, those are the stats that we are receiving here, which is 43%, yes, 39%, and then 18% are saying no. So thank you so much for participating in that. There's just last more that we'll also have at the end, towards the end. But this time I want to bring in now our panel members to also share their thoughts and views in relation to what has been presented and shared thus far. Dr. Vuyiwe, let me start with your good self and then Dr. Lassen will come in thereafter. Dr. Vuy. Okay, uh, thank you so much. And um, thank you for having me here. I really appreciate that. Um, I won't take much of your time, uh, but I want to appreciate first uh, the presentation that has been done by Mr. Mbanga. Uh, which is uh, spot on and relevant uh, in this situation. Uh, and I like the fact that uh, he's be, he has referred to local government uh, as a sphere that has to play a very crucial role in the society, not only on service delivery, but also to drive the economy of the, of the country. So uh, I also want to indicate that uh, as I'll be reflecting on these issues, uh, there are certain pertinent and peculiar issues uh, that you've, if we don't talk about them, uh, won't be able to resolve the issues or the challenges that are facing local government. Uh, as I'll be reflecting on those issues, let me be frank uh, that uh, the local government ground is moving. Uh, even if its future shape remains unclear, but it is clear to everyone that uh, at the current moment, it is moving. Uh, I want to, to, to refer to one Italian political philosopher by the name of Antonio Gramsci, who once said, I quote, and that ago, the old world is dying and the new world struggles to be born. Now is the time for the monsters. So uh, why this reflection is quite important to me, uh, I think with these conservations of local government, we have witnessed uh, several situations uh, and even before elections where we saw that the old world, world was dying, but the, the new one was struggling to come out. So um, as local government practitioners, I believe also that there is a new world that we envisage uh, but who are struggling to give back to that new world. Uh, you know, if I may just make an example, when you are planning to have a baby, there are some ways or processes that uh, make your labor and delivery of the healthy baby more easier. Uh, even the, the, the hospitals and the midwives would advise you to find a caregiver, to eat well, to stay fit, to consider, birth plan and also to attend prenatal cases. Why is that relevant? It's because you want to give birth to a healthy baby and, and because you want to see 
that new world that is coming out being a good and healthy new world. So what happens normally when you don't follow all those processes, you run a risk of miscarriages, you run a risk of low birth weight, you run a, a risk of malnutrition condition, as well as a, a risk of, a, of not having your baby to last long. Uh, in most municipalities, let me indicate that uh, before local government elections, everyone was seeing the old world dying and the challenge was in some of the municipalities, uh, the new world was struggling to be born. In some cases, the monsters took over. Uh, I would like to indicate also that my reference to a monster means an unknown or unplanned situation. That is a metaphor. That on its own resulted in what is referred to as in some of local government as coalition government. In South Africa, more the more than it, it was reported that more than 66 municipalities were hung, meaning they were left without outright majority party rule and required to form a coalition. That could be something which is good for other municipalities, but uh, I would like also to indicate that that could be a sign of malnutrition to some of the municipalities. As a result, as I'm speaking right now, most municipalities, those babies are likely to die anytime and others are already experiencing miscarriages. I read three days ago uh, to the media where it was said that the DA-led coalition, which is a Gurulen in this case, faces a risk of collapse. So those are the situations that we find ourselves in. And I have to be frank that all these systems and uh, the challenges, you know, depending on how they are being formed, they do have an impact on service delivery and the way in which these municipalities are operating. You know, when we have a baby that is uh, suffering from malnutrition, you spend a lot of effort, resources, you struggle to bring that baby back to the desired state of health. You get sleepless nights because you are worried that my baby might die any, at any point in time. And when we are confronted with these situations, we don't even get time to sit down and reflect as to what has happened, what led to this problem. Your focus is only on your baby that is about to die. So it is my view also that yeah, understanding the root causes to any challenges within local government is key because that's what needs to be looked at. Uh, I, I like the study by Elok uh, on leadership where he indicated that, uh, 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 he indicated a very interesting aspect of historical definition of the concept of leadership by saying, he stressed on the point that the elusive nature of the definition and his argument was in politics, leaders are sui generis, meaning that they are unique in that they rise to the office through a myriad of accidents, which do not necessarily reflect the ability to lead. I'm not going to dwell more on that, but I do support what uh, Elok uh, said in his studies. We saw the struggle where some of leaders were waiting to be sewn in and the municipalities to be established, but it was a struggle. In my previous studies, before I, I can conclude on issues of factionalism and political patronage, I highlighted some comments that were made by the president of South Africa when he was delivering a party election manifesto that was in 2019, where he indicated, I quote, factionalism and patronage have diminish the ANC ability to lead transformation processes and I close quote. And that was relevant and it's, it is still relevant even at this point in time. In this regard, I have to indicate that when we talk of issues of factionalism, it's not a, an aspect of South Africa. It, it's a worldwide challenge. It's a, it, it, it's a challenge uh, everywhere. Hence, one of the studies that were conducted by Saron, I think it was in 2014, reveal the effect of interfactional conflicts and government formation, and with specific focus on how factional conflict and intra-party organization affect a party's likelihood of being involved in a ruling coalition. What is of interest to me based on my previous studies and in relation to this, which is the root cause of most challenges in local government is the aspect of factionalism, which results in catastrophic uh, events. 
Uh, in some cases, senior managers become targets, and in some cases, service delivery becomes frustrated. Uh, as I've already indicated, Mr. Mbanga alluded to a very key point. And he even indicated uh, the fact that in some cases, we'll find political parties fighting amongst themselves. And I have to indicate that there's no doubt that when factionalism has reached a specific level within an, a certain local environment, political instability, you'll see challenges of that and symptoms of that. And if we talk of service delivery and economy, there's no way where service delivery will be stable in such environments. And there's no investor will come and invest within an area where there is instability in terms of uh, politics as well as in, in an area where there is no service delivery. Uh, I have to indicate that generally as leaders in local government, instead of looking for deep chronic causes into some of the challenges, we look for quick fix band aids and aspirin to treat the acute pain. We become fortified by temporary relief and we get busier and busier and forget that we have a role to play, that of providing services to the communities. And to this extent, we'll find most of communities suffering because of all these challenges that I have mentioned. Uh, I think my contribution will end there. Uh, Program director, I thank you so much. There we go. Well said, well put. Uh, Dr. Vuiwe, there's a lot of comments uh, that have actually come, come through as you might see on the chat box. Uh, we appreciate uh, just a few minutes of the time that you have uh, shared, you know, in that philosophical talk, but I'll also add, uh, you know, the uh, prophetic uh, statements that you have made. And I'm hoping that as we continue to engage uh, further, uh, that is, is definitely going to come through because as you have rightly put, there's so much that we've witnessed in the past couple uh, months, if not years, especially within our local government. And definitely, we can't keep on doing things the same way. And as the wise have said, and expect different results. So quite certainly, we have to try and do things differently from here on. So I appreciate all that you have shared with us uh, this morning. Definitely, I'm hoping we can get more when we have some discussions, uh, if time permits, as said earlier. So at this time, let me bring in uh, Dr. Lawson Naidu has said, and now is also in academia, previously with uh, National Treasury. Uh, so thank you so much once again, Dr. Larson, for making the time as well to be with us this morning. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Emmanuel, and good to see you and to the colleagues on the call. A very good morning to you all. Um, thoroughly enjoyed the first hour of it, and now you, you're making me second guess whether I, I made the right decision to join academia or should I have just stayed a practitioner? But uh, Having said that, I still see myself as a pracademic, um, having spent more time as a practitioner in, in the industry. Um, I'll try and make um, or do justice to the five minutes allocated to me and, and safe to say that uh, all the comments and, and all the input from the previous speakers and my colleagues, I, I fully support it and, and totally agree. But keeping in with the theme of today's session, and um, it's a pity that um, I wasn't uh, part of the previous ones. Uh, it's, it, there is some linkages, so there will be some synergy in terms of the bigger topics uh, and the sessions uh, that, that's going to unfold as, as we move on. But I had a look at some of the sub-themes, and, and the first one being the context and understanding of South African local government. Um, for me, Kia, and, and, and Satoli used the words role definition, and I think we can link it to that. Uh, we need to define our role as municipalities, firstly, from a socioeconomic perspective to address those imbalances uh, of the past. And, and secondly, uh, to clarify our roles as municipality in terms of our operations. And yeah, we're talking about the financial management aspect. And uh, as you've given out all my secrets, supply chain management is, is very close to me as well. So getting to the nuts and bolts of clarifying roles and together with all the other discussions about should we move into a centralized environment or a decentralized environment? So here for me, I think it's about the openness and transparency. That's how we need to contextualize and understand our local government um, sphere, becoming more open and more transparent. 
So citizens need to understand what is the business of municipalities for them to know what's going on. Citizen engagement and participation in policy decisions, probably this is happening to some extent. Hence, I use the word more openness and, and more transparency. And bringing it closer home, if we look at the supply chain management business model, I mean, we're all familiar with the elements, demand, acquisition, logistics, and so on. But nowhere in that model is there any reference to our citizens and our communities. Now, I'm not speaking here about those who live, live in the leafy suburbs of South Africa. I'm speaking about the most disadvantaged communities who become the beneficiaries of these goods and services that are procured through a supply chain management business model. And first and foremost, it's about receiving the basic human rights and needs as warranted and mandated by the constitution. But after all, citizens are the funders of these procurement processes that we are undertaking. So that for me summed up that first theme. And um, moving on to the next one, the regulatory framework and the applicable legislation. Um, we're not going to move away from legislation. As a government, it's not only in South Africa, it's not only in Africa, globally, all municipalities, all government institutions um, have to be controlled and regulated by legislation. Um, but when it becomes too much, when it becomes too overwhelming, we find ourselves possibly in a legislation fatigue and we don't want to be there because once we go into fatigue, you know what happens? The energy levels are down. Um, Emmanuel, you mentioned my passion, so probably my energy levels are still up. But when we look at fatigue, it means now there's nowhere to go. Practitioners are scared to even touch a document because there's some legislation that's going to find them wanting. So we need to look at it, but in terms of legislation, they needs to be updated, it needs to be relevant, it needs to be applicable in the current situation that we are in. And I'll speak about COVID and VUCA just now. So on the supply chain side, an urgent need. I mean, if we're looking at regulations way back in, in 2005 and the policy and the bidding documents, so they needs a major, and I'm appealing to the powers to be to issue a code red for public procurement legislation. I know there's talk about the bill and hopefully when that gets promulgated, it will solve some of these um, misinformation, misunderstanding, uh, different ways of applying the legislation, which gives, e gives effect to transgressions and irregularities. So key for me in that sub team, uh, Emmanuel and colleagues, is that we need to look at our regulations. And I do understand I once, uh, was uh, given the reason that you can't change legislation uh, all the time because of the process that it goes through. But we need to be practical in the sense that our practitioners depend on legislation to perform their daily work. Uh, the next theme of ways of, of overcoming current local government uh, landscape and um, shortcomings, um, working more closely with academia, and I think this is one of the reasons why I decided to, to leave government after almost three decades to join academia. And um, what I find is now currently is that many of my, my students, both at a master's and doctoral level, they're coming to us with the real life problems, real life problems that municipalities and organs of state are facing. And for me, that's phenomenal because at, at an MBA level, at a master's of business administration, or a doctoral of business administration level, these are business degrees. So we are trying to solve business and real life problems. And that is where I, I'm trying to, and that's one of my key initiatives for the 2022 academic year is to bring industry, and that's our practitioners into the classroom. And we've already started these discussions with the private sector, which become our key stakeholders because we want to make sure that industry practices informs the curriculum of our modules. We don't want to offer off the shelf theory, like you said, maybe we are too heavy theory. So how do we change that to make it more relevant, to make our graduates employable? Many of my graduates now are exiting the system. I need for them to find work in municipalities, in provincial and national governments, but I need for them 
to be taught the relevant and applicable curriculum content. So for me, that's something that I would like to see happening. And then talking about COVID-19, and I'm almost done, the COVID-19 and, and the pandemic, I mean, it came in the darkest night of the year and took all of us by storm. It is now the new normal. We have to embrace it. And I would like to borrow the words of, of my colleague, Dr. Vuyiwe, where, where she talks about the new world. This is the new world. So what needs to start happening now is that we need to start having discussion about post-disaster strategies. How do we deal with this disaster now? We can't say COVID is an unknown. It, it's no longer, it's a known. So let's start those discussions. And I'm appealing also to our leaders. And here I'm specifically talking about leaders who need to become situational and servant leaders. And I'll repeat that. They need to be very specific, situational, responding to the event and the eventuality at hand. I mean, our municipality is our operational. Every day is a new day. So we need our leaders to respond, to have that agility and that adaptability to become situational leaders. And working in a public sector environment, it becomes a non-negotiable. You are a servant leader. You are there to serve your local community, your local municipality, your provincial and your national government department. So there's more than enough data. Can we stop doing any more assessments and, and those type of reporting? Because there are lessons learned. There are experiences. And fortunately, and sorry for using fortunately in the same sentence as COVID, it's a global experience. We are learning from other countries and other municipalities all over the world as to what they have done. And sadly, some of our experience during this pandemic were not good stories to tell. All the scandals and all the allegations and the rest of the never ending drama. So I think in the interest of time, Emmanuel, let me stop there and I'll contribute more as we go along. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank well, you. Sebong. Sebong, Dr. Lawson. If I can attest to that, uh, the TUT is definitely making very good inroads in terms of uh, you know, the curriculum and revising it to be relevant and practical you know, in the public sector. So thank you so much sir, for that. And also to uh, Mrs. Khaya as well. You know, uh, we work very well with TUT and I'm trusting that more is to come. That will obviously have a greater impact you know, besides the academia space, but also you know, for the sector at large or for in, in public sector. So thank you for that. Um, I just want to bring in Mr. Mbanga now. We're going to, going, going to go into our discussions. Um, but before we do so, just a reminder that we, when uh, mo most of our participants registered, they will post some of the questions and comments during the registration uh, period. I just want to bring up one um, question. I'm just going to pick it up one second. Um, from Pilo Komzi Kaba. Uh, from the Council for Geoscience, uh, who posed the question, what really went wrong in our local government? What really went wrong in our local government? Is it because of political issues uh, or what other aspects that have actually caused all of this? Uh, she put it as uh, local government is suffocating. That is Ubilokomzi from Council for Geoscience. Mr. Mbanga, just to um, give it this to you, and also just some of the comments that have been shared as well, if you want to add on to that, Mr. Manga. Um, thanks very much. I, I, I'm not seeing any other um, questions per se. I mean, I'll be guided by you. So I think the, the simple answer to what went wrong with local government is that I think everything has gone wrong, you know? Um, but I think for me, the emphasis is on, on the point that to only blame local government as a sphere for what has gone wrong is in fact wrong. Right? That's a very untruthful way. Um, and in, it's not a sincere way of, of attempting to understand what the problem is. I earlier posited in the discussion the fact that I think the, the issue is systemic. Right? It's not just about local government. Remember that if we are talking about a system, we are also talking about dependencies, right? So when something goes wrong in local government, in part it is because 
local government is dependent on some aspect of the system for it to be able to succeed. That does not mean though that there are no faults within local government as a fraternity or as a sector on its own. There are fault lines within local government. I think for instance, um, one of the things um, uh, that is fascinating me um, uh, that was um, written by Ashraf Adam, uh, who I saw in, in, the, in the chat room here yeah, in, in, in an article he posted in the Herald, he speaks about, is it not possible that we could at least get our own human resource as local government rights, you know, uh, and make it competitive so that um, it's, not, it's, it's not just that we are um, uh, 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 telling others um, what, 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 what wrong they have contributed to local government, but, but us, can we not at least at the bare minimum just solve our own human capacity? Because frankly, um, I think in part, there's an inheritance that we have, you know, from the uh, inefficiencies of the Bantu stand system amongst others, including the apartheid system, just broadly speaking, you know, where we have inherited um, uh, 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 the type of local government soldier that is not willing to play their role, that is generally lazy, um, uh, 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 incompetent, you know. So, so, so I'm saying it's it's many things that have led to the current state of local government. Thank you, sir. Let me, let me bring another question, um, Dr. Buyewe. I would like you to touch on this particular question that I'm about to bring. Uh, fourth, it's from uh, Shayeb Densen, uh, who works at the Parliament of South Africa. Uh, she asks these questions, does the local government system sufficiently empowers its citizens and key stakeholders to influence and own the IDP as well as the budgetary processes of municipalities? And then further question is that how do we grow confidence in all stakeholders um, involved in local government? Because the trust levels are quite low, but the first question, just the issue of empowering of the citizens and key stakeholders to influence and own the IDP and the budgetary process. Just your views and thought on that, um, Dr. Bewe. Okay, um, thank you so much. Um, my view on these issues is that uh, local government is properly, properly regulated. Um, the legislation is clear. Uh, we even say at times that it's over-regulated. So there's no doubt that uh, there's clear guide and indication as to how a local government should be governed. Um, and also, I, I also want to touch on the aspect, uh, I think uh, that was raised on issues of party factionalism that should not impact on councillors serving their community. Uh, I fully agree with that. Uh, ideally, that that is supposed to be to be the case. And um, I have to reflect back to the research that I did uh, on issues of factionalism, where in this case I even made reference to some few municipalities where there was evidence which was clear that some other service delivery protests were instigated by competing factions uh, within those political parties. And it, it, it was clear also, uh, I, I referred to the case of Nelson Mandela Bay municipality as well as Kohisano, uh, I think it's a local municipality. So uh, I, I think what is important for local government practitioners because there are issues, the reason why I was referring to the issue of factionalism as a peculiar issue, because it's one aspect that as local government practitioners, we don't want to talk about. We always believe that it's a political aspect. Whilst we know that it directly affects our operations, the delivery of services, which is driven by us as officials. And it also affects a lot of things that are happening within our environment. So it's about time that when we have these discussions, we also discuss those issues and influence certain decisions that could be taken in some of those areas in order for the municipality to run smoothly. It's clear that uh, municipalities, are, even though they are the sphere of government that is closer to the people, but we cannot 
blame everything to the municipality or to the politicians or even to, to the officials. As one speaker has already said, a local government can only be effective uh, to everyone working together to ensure that a local government is being uh, run properly. Whether you are a community member or uh, you are another stakeholder or partner, but everything is possible if everyone works together. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Um, also, Yako um, Estazen, the comment, we must also appreciate that we are dealing with an outdated legislative frameworks that has not yet developed or changed with the current requirements of local government. It's crippling service delivery severely, specifically from the SEM perspective. Uh, I want you, Dr. Lawson, just to come in there as well to share more light into that. Thank you, Yako, for that um, comment that has been said, but I'm quite certain Dr. Lawson will, will be in a better position to add into it. Dr. Lawson. Thank you, Manuel. Um, absolutely, Yako, I couldn't agree with you more. And I did allude to it uh, in my introductory remarks. So definitely aligning what is the operations and what is the actual practices at the local government level. So obviously, and, and sometimes we find a disjoint between policy makers and implementers of legislation. So that working closer together and uh, I am aware that National Treasury has these SCM forums and stakeholder engagements that they have. So probably that's a step in the right direction to, to bring the implementers of legislation closer to the actual um, policies that are developed. So definitely the word that sums up Yaku's comment is outdated, as I've alluded to, uh, probably 17 years ago when the SCM regulations, for example, were promulgated and it's it's overdue. It's it's like I said, uh, we need to issue a code red on this one. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Philip, just your thoughts in relation to the role of the of the private sector in relation to all of these issues that have been touched upon. Because at the end of the day, uh, the other question that was posed um, was in regards to the key stakeholders involved in local government. Definitely, the private or the service providers also play a very critical role. Justin, what has been shared? What are your thoughts and views in regard to that? Uh, Dr. Ngobo, thank you very much. I think that um, perhaps we are not, um, it's been underplayed. I think the significance of, of, of decent partnerships between local government specifically and the private sector critical. Um, uh, speaking to Dr. Naidu's uh, uh, concerns with regards to supply chain, I think some of the issues that we that we really need to be cognizant of is establishing good partnership and good networks in the rural areas, because that's really where we're suffering, suffering the most. Um, just allowing um, small business and um, uh, uh, local enterprises to be incorporated into, into the formal structures of, of, of procurement in local government and not to relegate them to catering or car washes, um, but really allowing and creating a framework for, for participation in a formal, uh, formal manner. Um, just, I, I, I don't think you can underestimate the, the significance of the question that you've asked. And I think it's very, very important that we all, that you all just bear that in mind. Yes, uh, Doc, I, I fully agree with, with, with Dr. Naidu. Um, and I disagree with that we need more legislation. He spot on with, with the fatigue part of it. Um, and, you know, looking at the history, there was, there was a, um, in, the, in the baby shoes of democracy, you know, the whole world wanted to help. Um, and we are sitting with legislation influenced by, by international consultants and foreign aid uh, uh, stuff uh, or, or input, if, you can, uh, if I can call it that. Um, I think the, the legislation that we have, we've invested as a country billions in this. Uh, looking at the CSD, looking at, at, at um, what Dr. Naidu um, has done at Treasury, you know, he, he will feel that. Um, it was an extensive process. Um, my, my take is on it. We, we need to take what we've got 
and get that right. We, we don't get it right. It's too much. Uh, if you look at, at what uh, NARSA or the Department of Water Affairs uh, legislation that they are working with, it's the PFMA and the Water Services Act. You know, that's their two legislations. They maybe call it three. Look at, uh, Philip has made a list, and I mean, that's not an exhausted list. That is what local government must work with. And so every sector department, education, work with the basic uh, education act and whatever, you know, um, but, but we are sitting with this and that's where the fatigue comes from. You're doing right by the one legislation, but you, you're not doing right by, the, by another legislation. And maybe that alignment um, and, and that review and customize this for, for uh, how it works in practice. Because the way it's doing it now, I think, and my take on it is, is we are decentralizing um, the, 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 the rural areas because people with the ideas and with incentives and, and creativity is coming to the cities uh, where they should have been operating from where they are and stimulating that economies. And, 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 and there's, there's, a, there's a balance. That, that those who can pay, and, and I'm looking at the revenue perspective that we, we spoke about in the beginning, um, versus those that, that generate revenue in, in, in the rural areas or the smaller municipalities, that um, uh, 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 relationship or the, the, the averages are, are, um, are moving the wrong way. It's been for a couple of years, we can see it in the struggling municipalities, it's increasing, and um, and I don't want to say it's coming from legislation, but it, it needs it is uh, maybe stimulated or, or helped on by legislation. Um, then, on in terms of uh, I forgot that what I wanted to say now. Sorry, apologies uh, uh, for that. Um, yeah, let me leave it like uh, there. Then, uh, if I remember, and there's a time I will, I will give you that uh, penny of mine. Thanks, no, Doc. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Coroner. No, we won't blame it on age. Uh, it's, it's just that you forgot. It's all good. All good, sir. All right. Um, at, at this time, I'm about to bring in the poll. Um, and while I allow my panel members and the speakers just to look at the questions and answers, because after the poll, we'll then further uh, just do a, a last round of comments um, from everyone but also look at into addressing some of the questions that are there. And also after the, the poll that we're putting up here, I've got Professor Mayaba who just uh, came through. And I know that uh, he also likes to share on these issues of local government. I'll give him five minutes, not more than five minutes, Professor Mayaba, um, after the poll that we have just bringing it up. They've got it on your screens, in your view, what has caused failures in most of our municipalities, in your view, what has caused failures in our municipalities? Uh, well, there's a lot that is headed towards political leadership, as well as 9% currently uh, being the officials, the administration, and then some indicating the funding constraints in our local government. Uh, that's very quite interesting, 80% headed towards political leadership. I don't know whether is our politicians not doing what they're supposed to be doing? But as it stands, uh, that's where we are right now, uh, close to 80%, it's headed towards our politicians. So thank you so much for participating on this poll. We appreciate your views that have been put in via this poll. All right, so Professor Mayaba, let me give you a chance to say your five minutes as my panel members and the speakers uh, look at the questions uh, that have been posed as they're about to round off uh, the session for today. Professor Mayaba. Uh, Prof Mayaba, you just need to unmute. There is an unmute button uh, that you just need to press there. There we go. There we go. You can go. Can you hear me now? Now I can hear you, sir. Yes. Um, I'm not going to be doom and gloom today, as I usually do in local government. Thank you, Dr. Ngoba, and thank you to your panelists. You know, 
we have smaller package of municipalities that are performing. And I wonder why we don't look at the good practices of those municipalities. And when we talk about municipalities, as we talk as all of them have totally collapsed. There are a number of municipalities that are performing better. Um, I understand the issue of rural municipalities. The reason why they fail is because of the finances. Um, my involvement in local government on, the, on measuring municipalities, we simply realize that if you put measure on five municipalities that don't have an income, you create a failure at all. So why we have not looked at good practices of other municipalities that are performing and see what are the reasons why they don't perform. Coming to those three questions that are there, is it political leadership? Is it administration that makes local government fail? I would simply say it starts from the political leadership. Um, on the administration, my question is this, when we look at professionalization of public service, if I've chosen a career as a municipal manager or as a CFO, do I really need to appear on the newspapers for bad, for wrong reasons every day? I don't think so. I think the problem is, how do we manage our officials? I always say that if I manage my officials properly based on performance, that official will perform. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was nice, uh, sweet and short, if I can say. As you rightly said, unlike your good self, you're just more like me now because of age, you know, words just keep on rolling. Uh, but today you have respected the time. Thank you so much, my good friend. That was Professor Mayaba, a local government expert and also in academia and works very closely with a local government. Thank you, sir. So as I said at this time, I'm just gonna be giving a chance to all our speakers that we've had, uh, Baba Umbanga, uh, Baba Philip, and also Cornell, and then, then the two doctors. But before I do that, um, there is something that just came through on the chat about uh, agreed on good partnerships that are needed, but not just triple P's in the form of the uh, public-private partnerships, but now public-private community. That is uh, quite uh, you know, a good statement to make. Uh, you know, it's For me, it has always been a triple P's, but now we have this double PC that is also coming into the fore. Thank you so much uh, for that. So I will then start with the last rounds of comments, as said, as you I do your closing um, remarks. Just also touch on the questions that have been posed. Mr. Mbang also saw something that talks to climate change. What are we doing about climate change? If perhaps you can just touch on those aspects as we are about to round off the session for today. I'll start your good self, Mr. Mbanga, and then thereafter, Philip, Mr. Cornell, and then Dr. Lassen, and then lastly, Dr. Boile will come through. Mr. Mbanga? No, no, thanks very much. Um... So on, on climate change, um, I think there's a lot um, uh, uh, to be done. Um, I, I think we, we, we as local government, we, we, we just need to go back and, and think what it is that we need to do collectively. That is not to undermine um, a number of initiatives that are taking place that I think though are, are quite sporadic. So there's quite a number of initiatives in, in, in various municipalities. Um, and there's also individuals that are driving those initiatives with great passion, with a in-depth understanding of the subject matter. But I also want to, to propose that I think there's value in, in acting together as a sector. Why am I saying this? I was quite disturbed um, to notice at the at, at, at the uh, COP negotiations that took place now in in last year in November, that 
in the, the, the South African delegation comprised by and large, if not by far the majority was national government, whether it was in business, whether it was um, in, 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 in government, but there was very little of local government presence in, in that particular delegation. Understandably, COP and COPs, um, COP negotiations are national government to national government negotiations. I think, however, we have been very slack as local government in guiding our own national government on what to negotiate in, 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 in those climate change negotiations, as if we are not the ones that are going to be implementing this. Look, what gets to be negotiated at an international platform ultimately has to be implemented by local government. You know, when you, when you drive on the N2 between um, uh, Butterworth and I think as far down as Humansdorp, and I think now some parts of the Western Cape, there, 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 are, there are a lot of wind turbines that have been invested throughout that geography that are now contributing to clean energy. Um, that was driven large by local government. In 2009, local government was very organized in getting itself involved as part and parcel of the South African um, contingent of people that are looking at climate change. I think we have lost that particular battle. And, and again, yes, there are individual initiatives, but I think there's a need for a collective action on the part of local government when it comes to the issue of climate change. Not least because I think climate change and the way in which it has impacted on the sustainability of municipal institutions is a big threat, right? You know that we are supposed to be uh, uh, reticulators of water, um, electricity. You know we are in the game of food security or food insecurity, depending on, on how you define it. And I think we are just not there as a force, as, as the local government sector. Uh, those will be my closing remarks. I think in part responding to the question on what, what, what has to happen from a climate uh, a change uh, point of view. Thanks very much. No, Sebonga Baba. I hope you've enjoyed your outdoor presentation as well. Ah, <laughs> I've, I've, yes, I love this environment. It's lovely. Thanks yeah, very much. Dr. Baba. Uh, okay, I almost thank said, you. Dr. Dr. Philip, please come in with all these doctors here. It's like we're in a surgery. <laughs> you can come in, uh, Mr. Philip, just with your last thoughts as well. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ngobo. Um, I really appreciate the Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Coroner as well, do you want to add on to what uh, Mr. Philip has touched on? Professor Mayaba's uh, contribution with regards to the positivity, um, positive attitude or, or, or aspects. Um, generally looking at what we have with the state of low government, it's not all that bad. Um, sure, there are challenges, but it's our responsibility, each and every one of us, it's our responsibility to criticize less and be a bit more supportive in our local communities. Um, it's let's embrace the whole smart city approach. Let's embrace technology and let's do that to make just to make the lives for ourselves and our neighbors just a bit better. Sure, there's heavily, heavily uh, politicized environments and and it's become a dangerous place to work. But let's choose not to focus on the negative and let's focus on the positive um, environment and and make a, 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 a determined contribution um, to a better local government uh, sphere in South Africa. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for the participation. Thank you, Bayer. Thank you, sir. Bayer, thank you. Uh, Mr. Coronel, your last thoughts as well. Thank you, Doc. Um, maybe just uh, an opinion uh, in terms of climate change uh, or, or what the climate is doing. I think we, in terms of the local government's perspective, uh, there's a political climate, you know, there's economical climate. And, and that to me is the, is the local government climate change that we need to do because it's forever changing. There we see, saw it last year uh, with the political climate changing in a lot of municipalities. Let's learn the lessons from that, how it affects service delivery, etc., and how it affects the residents ultimately. You know, it, to me, it is um, 
uh, the legislative climate does it need to change it is all something that uh, that is ch uh, changing it's not only you know um lightning and the atmosphere and the uh, sun and the sun and the moon uh, you know um it is where we are if you are a government pra uh, local government practitioner that's your climate that's what you make yourself ready for when you enter the space um so yeah that's that's my final comment and and just thank you for the opportunity and uh, all the speakers i i like the, the frankness of, of these discussions and i think that's what's needed and that will take us forward uh, once again thank you for the opportunity <clears throat> great thank you mr cornell as well i can see also the chat there's quite a few comments coming in there thank you so much for that uh, participants so if you're taking note of all of these uh, just be aware of that as uh, we've been talking about the academic side of this we definitely will be taking this further to find a way of making use of this information and knowledge that we are getting uh, today and hopefully we can start to impact that practical side of it for our academic space dr lawson you can come in um, on your side thank you very much emmanuel and thanks to the colleagues uh, for the opportunity and i think not to repeat what i've already said but probably there are some um, points and some themes that emanated from all the contributions that we had from myself and my fellow panel colleagues as well. But more importantly, I think the questions and, and, and the chats, uh, this is coming from individuals who are on the ground. Um, they have this hands-on um, and, and, and they know best what's happening there. So I don't think we should take it lightly, you know, their feedback, very rich, and, and, and very, very valuable. So I think um, this starts the discussion uh, for many themes and many topics that uh, we all have introduced on this platform. Um, going back to the, the traditional triangle of systems, people, and, and processes, you know, to, to measure performance and to get things done in a generic organization. Uh, yes, public sector might be unique uh, in, in its own sense of the private sector, but if we look at these three areas, uh, I'm convinced that on the system side and, and the process side, which is the way of how we do work, we're pretty much okay in, in municipalities. So for me, we need to focus on the people side and, and probably that's where the, the work that needs to happen, you know, uh, issues of trust and ethics, you know, you can't teach people these things, you know, it, it needs to become inherent in one's uh, daily work. And, and probably then I'll just squeeze in uh, the role of academia then like my earlier comments is how do we equip our young graduates to to hit the ground running so to speak when they join municipalities and one of our colleagues has suggested that you know they they work for a year in a government department after completing their studies absolutely and, and we are open to that we are open as tut and, and probably speak on all the higher education institutions we are open to embracing that um, idea of having our graduates do even vacation work at, at some of the government institutions. So I think, uh, yeah, and then in closing, it's, it's about again working together. I mean, there's no way uh, we can work in silos and, and we can work as islands on our own. Uh, we need to come together collectively, each one of us with our own skill set, with our own competency, our own knowledge, and how do we pull this? And, and this platform then becomes that think tank that we are looking for, uh, which can change the ship. And, you know, changing the direction of a ship, a big ship like the local government in South Africa is a tall order, but how can we move in another direction and, and slowly, of course. So Emmanuel, I think I leave it there. And thank you very much for the opportunity. It was awesome being on this platform. I got to visit all the nine provinces in the comfort of my chair. Um, and, and I see many of the participants, I have engaged with them and it's good to be back. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Certainly, certainly. So we, we're embracing the 4IR and the, the new normal. It's now become a normal, you know, so definitely. And, and uh, I definitely agree with, with that statement of work integrated learning. We definitely need that. Um, let's not close our doors as public departments and municipalities. Let's make sure that we can get these young ones to get the practical experience that they so need because for the TUTs, the DUTs, as I said, I'm involved as well in to some extent with them. So we do need municipalities to take our youngsters, you know, because as we said, we want them to be competent 
We want them to be credible and also to inculcate these high ethical standards and values within them. Thank you so much, sir. So let me hand over now to Dr. Vuyiwe, your closing statement. Uh, uh, the philosopher, and I said, uh, pro prophecy as well, I do if you may have as you close off for us. Dr. Vuyiwe. All right, uh, thank you so much. Uh, my closing remarks, uh, I would like to say and even suggest that uh, I believe uh, there's more work that has to be done, uh, more research that has to be done uh, with regards to some issues or challenges that are affecting local government. And we need more sessions of this nature to discuss and have engagements on these issues. Uh, having worked for local government for appro approximately 25 years, uh, I can attest that there are good things about local government and there are also bad things about local government as well. Uh, most of us, we, we speak of working together, uh, which is a good thing that I would also encourage uh, because I also mentioned that. Uh, well, I, I said before, when we are in this sphere of government, uh, you find yourself in a position where you see that the ground is shaking. Uh, uh, even though uh, it is not clear as to what the shape of this ground is, because in most uh, councils it is not, it is still not clear. There was once a, a study that I once uh, did on issues of disaster resilience, where they spoke of community of practice, where in this case um, community members were working together with their local government in ensuring that service delivery gets to the people. But I have to be honest and say that given my experience, there are certain practices that theoretically are good, uh, but which cannot be implemented in our particular environments. There are certain rules in those environments that are not written down. There are certain values that we won't see on the charter of values. There are certain cultures that are being promoted which such cultures are not uh, specifically um, meant to, to achieve the actual objectives of local government. So uh, it's difficult in some of the environments. That's why when I speak of local government issues, I tend to not to generalize, but to be specific on some of the environments because what you see in another environment, the good thing that you see, that good thing cannot be applicable maybe in your environment because of those issues pertaining to cultural issues, norms, practice, as well as the rules that are not written down. Uh, I once uh, did a, a presentation and a proposal with Vet School of Governance on issues of political leadership just before the elections, because we're looking broadly on the aspect of oversight and as to how uh, it can be strengthened. And we also recognize the fact that there are uh, systems in place and mechanisms like your induction, but we also looked further on the caliber of councillors that were going to come in and given our past experience. Uh, I think that is one area that uh, even ourselves, uh, the reason why I said initially, uh, some of the things we need to tend to shy away from them as practitioners and say that this is political. Whilst we know very well that those political issues do affect the way in which we are operating. The issue of strengthening political oversight is very important. Uh, I've seen some of the councils just before, uh, just during the elections, who had about 80 to 90% of new councillors who never been with local government before. Uh, some never worked for public services as well. And those councillors are expected uh, to ensure oversight. Some have been assigned to uh, portfolio committees to ensure that they oversee how things are happening. Uh, I'll just make an example. Myself as a practitioner that has been within local government for more than 20 years, I still don't understand technical aspects of asset management. I'm just making an example. I don't understand 100% how to read financial statements. Then when we bring all those reports in front of that new person who doesn't know anything about local government to play an oversight, where are you taking your municipality to? So uh, what I'm trying in a, to say in a nutshell is that there are certain things that we shy away 
because we are scared that people will say this or maybe I might be dismissed or I might be unpopular and all of that. We don't talk about those things as officials or local government practitioners. Whilst we know very well that they've got an impact on how those local governments are being governed and a uh, service delivery goes to the people. So uh, that's what I wanted to say in my closing uh, remarks uh, in this regard. And I also want to thank you once more for the invitation. Thank you. No, spot on Dr. Buiwe on those last uh, comments that you have shared. Appreciate it to all our speakers and the panelists that have had for your time for two hours that you have spent with us, as well as the preparations towards this session. As everyone has been saying, very informative, very insightful, practical, but importantly, progressive, because we want to change the landscape of our local government. So to everyone, thank you so much, participants as well, for providing some of the comments and suggestions that you have put forth. We truly, truly appreciate. Let's look forward to next week um, as our sessions continue. Same time from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. We are looking forward to further engagements and more to come out of this. Sebok.